I think this is a very important meeting and it's an exciting meeting because we all participated in these very high scientifically performed trials but out of those trials for years we have not been able to treat any patients despite the fact that we knew that there was something out there that will help our, our very severe asthma patients. So it's really exciting right now that we have the ability to treat our patients. Um, the Allaire Bronco thermoplasty system is a pretty straightforward, easy system that consists of an uh, Allaire radio frequency controller that delivers the energy. And on the other hand, you have to connect it to the Allaire catheter, which is a flexible uh, basket catheter that can be delivered through any flexible bronchoscope. Um, we briefly go through these points. Um, we need patients with severe asthma. It's registered for use over 18 years. Uh, when the asthma is not well controlled with our current optimal medication using inhaled corticosteroids and long-acting beta agonists. Uh, patients should, however, have no pacemaker or internal defibrillator or other implantable electronic devices because of the fact that we're using RF energy and there's no data yet of safe use in these patients. And the other things are pretty obvious. Um, there are some contraindications, uh, so active respiratory infections, uh, severe asthma attacks previously uh, in the recent history because uh, the treatment will aggravate the symptoms during the treatment phase a little bit. And uh, when you go to the procedure, you really have to inform your patient of what you're doing because it's, it's, a, it's a treatment period that you put your patient through. It's, it's about a two and a half to three months uh, treatment phase. It's three bronchoscopies with three to four weeks in between. And we prepare our patients to be ready for that with uh, a short course of high dose prednisolone because of the reactive airways. And anyone who did bronchoscopies in asthma know how the tissue can respond to even touching the airways. So they need to be prepared for those procedures. And there's some standard advice which we give to all our patients after bronchoscopies. Uh, there are also reasons not to perform the bronchoscopy despite the fact that we did it. And that are some uh, indications over here. So the patient forgot to take the prednisolone, or a low oxygen saturation, which we didn't anticipate on, a sudden increase in asthma symptoms, uh, asthma exacerbations that have not been reported uh, in the last week. So normally it's, it's very wise to call the patient a week before it comes in if it's still stable. And also before treatment, a post bronchodilator FFV1 uh, should be within the range that's normal for this patient. There should be no huge differences. And the other ones are also very obvious for these kind of elective interventional uh, yeah, therapies. Um, on the day of the procedure, we have to really make sure that the patient is still fit enough. We're still very cautious in these therapies. It's a bronchoscopy in a, in a patient that does not tolerate bronchoscopies very well. So you have to manage the patient and you have to make sure that every preparation has been made. And normally uh, in the trials, the bronchoscopies have been performed uh, mostly on a moderate sedation, but can be performed under general anesthesia also. And furthermore, just use your own guidelines and own wisdom and own skills to treat these patients. So recovery is pretty straightforward and it's an outpatient procedure. And two to four hours after recovery, uh, the patient should be able to be discharged. And at that moment, we'll check breath sounds, symptoms, and also check if the spirometry returned a little bit to within the baseline levels. Um, and then also the prophylactic prednisolone the day following the bronchoscopy has to be taken also. So when we go into a procedure, one of the key issues is to, to plan your procedure. We have two lungs and we decided to do this treatment in three phases. First right lower, then left lower, and then two upper lobes. It's a lot of treatment area which we cover from small airways to large airways. And we really go into, and we'll show it later on in the hands-on, to map the airways. Every airway in every patient is different and you really should make a treatment plan. Uh, when we do this uh, in the second and the third time, we also go back to review the treated areas if there's any damage or anything that's not normal. We didn't encounter those things. And also, yeah, work systematic. So when you start these treatments and you get sequential patients, always work in the same order. So work from proximal to distal, or at least when you treat your patients, always treat them in the same way. Let's go from LB1 to LB2 to LB3, 4, 5. So follow your same routine, so don't mess things up. Because then you know what areas already have been treated and what areas you still have to treat. 
And it's really recommended to use also a map to keep track of the areas you've been treating because there's a lot of area out there that you can treat. So there are also reasons to, to terminate a procedure and that can happen when the areas are unusually edematous or inflamed so that, you, that there is really a lot of mucus. Um, when you see, when you go back in to the other side, you see there's still a lot of inflamed tissue, uh, edematous tissue in the previously treated areas. It might be wise to postpone your treatment. And also, when an airway cannot be accessed, don't treat that area. So post-procedure care is, uh, like I said before, pretty standard forward. Um, we, we normally uh, discharge the patient the same day, only when he re feels really worse after the treatment, and FEV1 is much lower than before, as stated over here. We'll keep the patient overnight um, and, and keep in contact with this patient over the next weeks until the follow-up uh, visit is scheduled. And it's recommended to do that within a short time of this treatment to assess if the next treatment can be performed. Um, it, it's, all, it's all consistent and manageable, it's easy, so uh, it can, it, yeah, the patient get a little symptoms for a day, for a few days, but be, prepare the patient that there will be more symptoms during the treatment phase. It's asthma patients, sensible airways, uh, there will be some edema, there will be some wheezing, but after the final treatment has been done, three, four weeks out, the patient will recover from that treatment phase and will, you will get the results as you saw before. And so far, no anticipated device-related adverse events have been shown in all these events. So when you go out and to build your own bronchothermoplasty program, you really should get uh, a dedicated program. Uh, it's a team approach, and a bronchoscopist alone cannot do this. You should have access to these patients and, and build, a, build a treating team with your bronch staff, but also with your asthma team, and also make sure you have proper and decent follow-ups and also before you enter the patients, make sure they really have asthma, have severe asthma, have been properly taken care of, are in optimal medication, and despite those things, still need additional therapy. And when you really want to have loads of patients, you can go for the bottom lines, and that's up to you.